Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. And this is our regular weekly message. But today is not a regular Sunday. Today is Palm Sunday. So happy Palm Sunday to everyone watching. Today is the day when we, the faithful followers of Jesus, celebrate his triumphant entry into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. It's the day that we commemorate when the people shouted for joy and celebrated the coming of Israel's king. It's also the first day of the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. Before that week ended, Jesus would have been falsely accused, unjustly tried, condemned with extreme prejudice, sentenced to capital punishment, brutally beaten, hung on a cruel Roman cross, died and buried for three days and three nights. This is the beginning of Jesus's Passion Week. Today's message is choosing Jesus. So turn with me please to our scripture found in Mark chapter 10 verse 32 through 34 and then on to Mark chapter 11 verse 1 through 11. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them and they were amazed and those who followed were afraid and taking the twelve again he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. After three days, he will rise. Chapter 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a cold tide, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying that colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that had cut from the fields. And they went before, and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the first day of the week. What we refer to as Palm Sunday or the triumphant entry. But before we get too deep into our message, I want to draw your attention to the parable Jesus told just before he started out for Jerusalem. For that, we need to turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. It was the parable of the 10 minus. Jesus told the parable to help the people understand the principles of the kingdom of God. To help them to understand more clearly because they thought that the kingdom of God would appear suddenly. In that parable, a nobleman was going on a journey into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then he was to return. This is an exact picture of Jesus, the Messiah. This also is the very last parable that Jesus would tell just before he would soon die, be buried, be raised from the dead on the third day, and then ascend 
into heaven and be seated at the right hand of the Father. After a while, come back to claim his kingdom. So why this particular parable? And why would Jesus wait until now to tell this particular parable? Well, let us focus on the last two verses of that parable and we'll find out. Luke chapter 19, verse 26 through 27. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Jesus waits to tell this particular parable because it is the most opportune time. The people had gathered to celebrate the Passover. They were thinking that the kingdom of God was going to appear suddenly, probably at the time of this particular feast. Everybody was gathered as per the law. In Jerusalem, they celebrated the feast of Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. They did not realize that the kingdom of God had to come spiritually first and then it could come physically. Jesus had already told the people that the kingdom of God had come upon them in Luke chapter 11 verse 20. The people wanted to make Jesus their king. They wanted to take him by force to be their king. But Jesus was trying to teach them that he must first suffer, then be raised from the dead, and then go away or ascend into heaven for a little while and then return and then set up his kingdom. But just like the noble man did in the parable, in his parable, Jesus said that the nobleman gave 10 minas to 10 servants, one mina each, and then he went away. Remember what we've been teaching. The number 10 is the number of covenant. Jesus has made a covenant with us. He will be back. The other miners hated the nobleman and did not want him to reign over them. That's the reason they did not receive a, a minor, because they refused to accept him as their king, and thus they refused his covenant, the covenant that he wanted to make with all people, because he wanted to redeem all mankind. That was his mission, but only a few accepted him, and only a few then will receive it. There was nothing that Jesus could do against their will. It was the time for choosing. In fact, that very same day, the day of the triumphant entry, the first day of the week was the 10th day of Abib, which was in the Old Testament. Nisan is a modern day, which equates to our March or April, depending on the calendar year. So what was so special about that day, the 10th day of a bit? Well, let us look and see. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, and then we'll skip down to verse 6. It says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lamb at twilight. The people of Israel were instructed to choose a lamb on that day, the 10th day of Abib. And then they were to take care of it until the 14th day, which would be Passover. And then they were instructed to slaughter it at twilight. 
is a perfect picture of what was unfolding right before their very eyes. Their none seeing eyes. This is that day, the day of choosing the sacrificial lamb. The people, as well as the high priest, were to choose a lamb, a Passover sacrificial lamb. When Jesus came riding triumphantly into Jerusalem, the people chose him, albeit unknowingly, but still they chose Jesus to be the Passover sacrificial lamb that would be slain only four days later on the 14th day of Abib. The people chose Jesus as their king in this way. They spread their cloaks along the road for him to ride on with his donkey. That seemed to me to be the same way that the people of Israel did when they chose Jehu to be their king. Turn with me please to 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 12 through 13. And they said, that is not true. Tell us now. And he said, thus, and so he spoke to me saying, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. So a little backstory here. This isn't the very first time that Jehu is anointed king of Israel. Not only that, but Jehu is the only anointed king of the northern kingdom after the split. God had chosen Jehu years earlier, probably from the time he was quite young. It's easy to miss, but God told Elijah to go and anoint Jehu from the time Ahab was king. And it did not actually come to pass until the time of Ahab's son. Flip back. One book, please, to the book of 1 Kings. God is speaking to Elijah here. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15 and 16. It says, And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Ahaziel to be king over Syria, Jehu the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. Actually, God instructed Elijah to anoint three people, Ahaziel, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, and Jehu, the grandson of Nimshi. This was right after the showdown of Jezebel's prophets, uh, uh, prophets of Baal and prophets of, of Astoreth on Mount Caramel. And then Elijah took a 40 day journey without food into the wilderness until he arrived at a cave in Horeb, the Mount of God. And there God told Elijah to anoint these three men for service. Years later, after Elijah was taken up into heaven, Elisha calls one of the sons of the prophets and gives him a flask of oil and instructs him to go to Ramoth Gilead and look for Jehu and anoint him king over Israel, which is in the ninth chapter of the second book of Kings. The young prophet was to take Jehu into an inner chamber, close the door, and anoint him king. Then he was to open the door and run. When Jehu came out, his fellow soldiers wanted to know what this prophet wanted with Jehu. At first, Jehu resisted telling them. And he made up some story about, you know the madman, you know his ways, you know he, he talks foolishness. But he was obviously dripping in oil and they called lies. That is a lie, Jehu. Tell us what this prophet wanted with you. So Jehu confessed. 
And right there and then, they spread their garments under him. They blew the trumpet and they proclaimed, Jehu is king. Here we are back at the triumphant entry. And the people are now again spreading their cloaks under a young man by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. They spread their cloaks on the road and they proclaim this Jesus, King of Israel. But they even went a step farther. They went into the bush, into the wilderness, and, and, and into the woods, and they began to cut palm branches. And they began to spread those branches on the road as well. According to Jonathan Kahn, the branches that were engraved in the temple represented the Garden of Eden and our eventual return. If that is the case, then these branches that were cut and spread represent our return, close communion with God, just like it was in the Garden of Eden. They were not instructed to celebrate this feast, the Feast of Passover, with these branches. But only, they were only instructed to celebrate it that way at the Feast of Tabernacles. So when the people took the garments and spread them on the road under Jesus, they were choosing him king. Even their words says the same thing. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. There was no doubt the implications of what they were doing and what they were saying. And that's why the Pharisees in the crowd told them, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus could not rebuke them because if they kept silent, even the stones would cry out. Why? Because Jesus must be chosen that day. When they took the celebrations to the next level by cutting leafy branches and palm branches, they were celebrating his reign as king, bringing us back into a time of intimacy with him, a close personal communion with God himself. Nothing that was done was done without significance. Everything had a meaning. Everything had a reason. But even after all that choosing, all of that celebration, just four days later, at the time of the Passover sacrifice, those same people would reject Jesus and slay him, even though they did not realize it at the time, but they would offer him as their Passover sacrificial lamb. The one sacrifice that will restore all things. Here's the bottom line. Just like those people made a choice to choose Jesus that day, we too must choose Jesus today. Because today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is promised to no man. It is not just enough, however, to be a part of the choosing. Many people say that they choose Jesus. Many people believe Jesus exists. Many people even believe that he died, he rose again. Many people believe that he's coming back. They even believe that they themselves are Christians. But they do not live for him, nor do they obey his commandments. And therein lies the problem. Therefore, it is not just enough to believe and everything will be okay. The truth is, God cannot just overlook your sin. He can't just disregard your transgressions while you continue on knee deep in them, committing the same sins day after day after day. God just can't sweep them under the, the, the carpet and thus forget them, so to speak. Why? 
because God is a just and righteous and fair judge. Therefore, he must uphold the demands of the law. And the law says that the soul that sinneth shall die. So what is God to do? He must carry out the sentence of death. Think about this for a second. If a civil judge in our time was to set every criminal free, even though the law says that that person must be punished, we will call that judge an unjust judge. And that's the same reason why God cannot overlook sin, because he is not an unjust judge. He cannot break his own laws. So that put God in, God in a dilemma, so to speak. What was he to do? He, he must uphold the demands of the law, but he, he does not want to sentence anyone to punishment in the lake of fire. So he finds a solution for our problem. That's not his problem. It's our problem. But God takes it upon himself and he claims it as his own problem. So he has to find a solution for us because we can't find a solution for ourselves. Only God can provide that solution. So the solution is found in his son, the God-man, Jesus Christ. Understand this. Jesus existed before his physical birth 2,000 years ago. He existed as the Word of God. That is why John's Gospel describes him as the Word that became flesh, full of grace and truth in John chapter 1, verse 14. God the Father saw the plight of man. He saw our plight. He saw our hopelessness. And he asked his son Jesus, to come and be the sacrificial offering that would be the payment for the wages of sin. Jesus agreed and so he obeyed and he came. He gave his life for us, the innocent for the guilty. We are that guilty. Jesus is the innocent, yet he died for us. So we must now believe that Jesus came in the flesh that he died a physical death as payment and accept him as Lord and Savior over our lives. You are no longer your own. You are now bought at a price, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. Now you must turn from your sinful ways and pursue holiness because Jesus died for you. Jesus gave his life that you might live, that you might have life and have life more abundantly. So have you done that? Have you turned your life over to Jesus? Have you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life? If you believe that Jesus died, rose again on the third day, that he's coming back and that that he'll have his rewards with him. And do you want to be ready for that day? Because only those who are ready will spend eternity with him. If that is you, here's what you need to do. You need to repeat this, repeat this prayer after me. You need to believe in your heart that this is true. And you need to accept that this is the way that Jesus will forgive you of your sins, that he will save you from death, from the second death in a lake of fire, eternal punishment. If you're ready to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, all you gotta do is to repeat this prayer after me. Here's the prayer. Father, forgive me of my sins. I thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for coming. I believe that you lived, you died, 
you rose again. That you're seated at the right hand of God the Father. I believe you're coming back to get us. And I want to be ready. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to be ready that you will find me doing what I should be doing. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins. It'll be like you never, ever sinned. You'll be truly blessed. You'll stand redeemed before God. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what you should be doing. What I want you to do is to get a Bible. Read your Bible every single day. Highlight the verses that are meaningful to you. Those verses that will help you fight the spiritual fight that we're in. We're in a spiritual war, people. The devil and all his hordes are warring for your souls. But Jesus paid the price for you. You don't have to go to that place of punishment. And those of you who accepted Jesus, find yourself a church, a Bible-believing church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Jesus loves you. He loves you dearly. We love you. Happy Palm Sunday. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.